This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, let's carry on with um, chapter one of the paper P2 uh, lecture notes. And in the previous lecture, I revised activity-based costing, uh, where we were getting the cost per unit for each product. Um, and helped us fix the selling price, look at the profitability and so on. Uh, but in paper B2, we can take it a little bit further and use exactly the same sort of approach, the same sort of thinking, and to um, examine how profitable our customers are. And to show you what I mean, the first of two examples, um, exercise three, have a read with me. And let me use this, as I said, to explain the logic of what we're doing and how we go about it. Vilnius Limited manufactures components for the heavy goods vehicle industry. And the following annual information regarding three of its key customers is available. Well, as you'd expect, we know the gross margin, uh, selling price less um, manufacturing costs, the gross margin uh, that we're earning from each of the three customers. So it's 897,000 from uh, X, 1.07 million from Y, 1.056 million from Z. And so, normally, a company would tend to look at that and say, right, our most important customer is obviously Y, closely followed by Z, followed a fair bit uh, behind by X. Uh, but we want to keep all our customers happy, but uh, clearly, Y and Z seem the most important. Uh, we know how many orders they place uh, during the year. And we know how many sales visits uh, and how many invoices are raised. Uh, the invoices here, are obviously, you can see are tying in with the number of orders. And sales visits, I think uh, it's going to be expected that we'll spend a lot more time visiting Y and Z who are by far the biggest, and less time perhaps visiting X. However, we've been using activity-based costing approach to determine customer-related costs. Because sales visits obviously are costing us money. Um, processing orders, dispatching, billing, they're all costing us money. And whereas we tend normally to think, oh, sales visits, you know, our salesmen costing us 20,000 a year or something. Um, and look at that, think about that completely separately. We can use activity based and say, well, how much are we spending a year on sale, our salesmen? How many visits are they making a year? And we can perhaps get a cost per visit. And it's been done here. So they found those uh, costs using standard activity-based costing in the same sort of ways we did in the last lecture. But now let's apply that to each of the customers and see in a sense what are the net profit we're making from each of them is. So our customers are X, Y, Z. Uh, we know the gross margin. Uh, 897,000, 1.07 million, 1.056 million. But let's charge against that um, an amount for the cost of all the sales visits, the cost of processing the orders and so on. So if we subtract the customer specific costs uh, first of all what about these sales visits each visit costs 420 and so I shouldn't need to write down the working uh, X, there are 80 visits, so 80 visits at 420 each time. It's costing us to visit X 33,600, whereas Y 
A hundred visits at 420 each time is 42,000. Uh, and Z, 140 visits at 420 each time is 58,800. So it's just like activity-based costing, but we're applying the costs here, not to individual products, but to uh, the customers. These are sales-related costs. Uh, what about order processing? Well, every order processed, we're charging at 190. How many orders are there? X has 200, so 200 at 190 is 38,000. They'll be charged to X, against X, not charged to them, sorry. Um, so Y, uh, 320 orders at 190 is 60,800. Uh, and to Z, 700 orders is 190 each time, 133,000. So I think you can see what's happening. Uh, but let's quickly finish it off. Uh, next, uh, dispatch costs. It's 350 for every order that's placed. And so X 200 orders at 350 is 70,000. Uh, y 320 orders at 350. 112 and Z um, 700 orders at 350 to 45,000. And finally, uh, billing and collections. Same idea, this time it's 97 per invoice. X has 200 invoices at 97. 19,400. To Y, we're sending 320 invoices. And finally to Z, uh, 700 invoices. 67,900. And so, having charged these customer related costs, we end up with in a sense, a net margin for X897 minus 33,600, 38,000, 70,000, I get 82460 and finally to Z 1.056 million So arithmetically, I, 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 I don't think too much of a problem. But what's the relevance of that? It asks us how should the customers be ranked? Uh, well, it turns out that Y, Y, remember, did have the highest gross margin, and Y, on this basis, does turn out to be best. Um, 824,160. However, second best is X. We were just looking at gross margin, seemed to be um, quite a way down on the other two. But X turns out to be second best, and um, Z turns out to be third best. And who cares? Well, surely we want to make them all more profitable, if you, if you would agree. And so we should start asking ourselves that look at Z. Um, although Z has almost as much revenue, uh, gross margin rather, as Y, why is it that Z is coming third in the rankings? It's because of things like so many orders placed and invoices raised.
Now, all right, we want them to play sorts of orders, but I wonder if there's any way we can talk to them and persuade them to place fewer orders of a larger amount. We don't want to buy any less in total, but you know, if they're placing 700 orders and every order is for a thousand units, it's a thousand units. Is there any way we can persuade them to have orders of 2,000 units each time? Then there'd only be 350 orders. And if there are only 350 orders, uh, order processing cost would be uh, lower. Um, we need fewer invoices, billing and collections cost would be lower. I think you see what I'm getting at. So it's one of the ways we can manage our customers uh, differently, better. At the end of the day, we stuck with what the customer wants, and you know, they're all giving us uh, a healthy margin there. But it, 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 it does direct us where to focus. We need to focus a bit of attention on the Z uh, and see if we can arrange things differently. Do we really need so many sales visits? Again, don't misunderstand me. We don't want to lose a good customer, obviously. Your sales visits may mean they buy less, and that's no good. But it does give an idea where to direct our attention. So that was uh, that one was just ranking them, but in a very similar sort of way, um, we can come up with a customer profitability statement and see what how much what is the the amount we're earning per customer, you know, in a sense, that one we just did, we're earning 736,000 a year from X. But for individual customers, we could do a profitability statement. And you'll see uh, on the next page, paragraph 6.2, there is no set format for it. We'd set it out whatever way we found useful. But normally, uh, it would be something like what we've got there. There's um, the, the pro forma, revenue at list prices less any discounts we give. Uh, that gives the net revenue. Subtract the cost of goods sold, that gives us the gross margin. And then subtract these customer specific costs. Um, examples there, financing costs. But, um, but as in the previous one, dispatch costs, whatever. So just as a quick look at exercise four. Uh, Frodo supplies shoes to Sam and Gollum. Each pair of shoes has a list price of 50 and costs Frodo 25. As Gollum buys in bulk, they get a 10% trade discount for every order for 100 pairs of shoes or more. Sam receives a 15% discount irrespective of order size because they collect the shoes themselves, therefore saving us distribution costs. The cost of administering each order is 50. The distribution cost is 1,000 per order. Sam has 10 orders a year, 420 shoes in total. Gollum, five orders, 100 pairs each. Which customer is the most profitable? Well, let's do a statement for each of them. I'll do them side by side. Gollum and Sam. Uh, first of all, how much revenue are we earning from each? I'll use the same format as a suggestion in 6.2 at the top. Uh, how much revenue from each? Uh, Gollum. Oh, I've lost it. I've lost it. Oh, at the end, Gollum placed five orders of 100 pairs. So they're ordering in total, oh, I'll write it down there, I don't get lost, five orders, 100 pairs, so 500 shoes. And um, the, the revenue before discount, I'll show the discount separately, it's $50 in the first line, is the list price. So 500 at 50, 25,000. Uh, whereas Sam, Sam places 10 orders, in total, it's 420 shoes. And so, again, at 50, before any discount, the revenue is 21,000. 
Uh, now we need to bring in any discounts to get the net revenue. Uh, Gollum gets a 10% discount for every order of 100 or more, and they are ordering 100 each time. So a 10% discount would be 2,500. Uh, whereas Sam gets a 15% discount. 3,150. And so we've got net revenue, 22,500 for Gollum. And for Sam, 17, ah, 850. Uh, off of that, uh, subtract the cost of goods sold. Um, which is, they cost $25 each. So uh, Gollum, five hundred at twenty-five dollars is twelve five hundred. Uh, as far as Sam is concerned, it was four hundred and twenty. Four hundred and twenty shoes at twenty-five dollars each is ten five hundred. And so before any other um, costs. Uh, we seem to be making a gross margin here of um, 10,000 in the case of Gollum and of 7,350 in the case of Sam. And traditionally, that's as far as we go if we're comparing, Gollum would appear to be the more profitable customer. However, what about customer specific costs? However, uh, we need to uh, subtract any customer specific costs. And there are two mentioned in the question. It mentions the cost of administering each order and the distribution cost. So the cost of administering uh, it's fifty pounds, uh, fifty dollars per order. So Gollum had uh, 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 five orders, uh, and at a hundred each time. Sorry, fifty each time. That's two fifty. Sorry, I'm being stupid here. Five orders at fifty each time. Uh, whereas Sam placed ten orders at fifty each time. Is 500, no problem. Uh, in addition, on the other cost mentioned is distribution costs. It's a thousand per order. So again, Gollum had five orders at a thousand, is 5,000. Um, as far as Gollum's concerned, uh, sorry, that was Gollum. I can't remember which one I said. Uh, but as far as Sam's concerned, there are 10 orders at 1,000 each time would be 10,000. But remember, uh, he gets the discount of 15% because they collect the shoes and there aren't any distribution costs. So in fact, that discount is very worthwhile. Uh, a discount of 3,150 to save ourselves 10,000. As a result, the net gain on each customer um, for, I keep losing my order, Gollum, uh, 4,750, uh, Sam, 6,850. So again, bringing in these customer specific costs, um, you know, earlier the gross margin which is what traditionally we might only look at. Gollum is our best customer of the two. Got more revenue, a bigger gross margin. But in fact, when we take into account the costs of dealing with the orders, the admin, the distribution, it turns out that Sam is better. And it's primarily, of course, because his discount um, 
it's because the fletching mill shoes, we, we, we don't have that 10,000 cost that we would otherwise have of distribution. And in fact, if we look at it per pair of shoes, the gain per pair uh, from each customer, the number of pairs, uh, in total we're selling 420 to Sam and to Gollum five pairs, five orders of a hundred. And so the gain per pair of shoes Uh, Golem, 47 divided by 500 is $9.50, uh, whereas Sam uh, comes to 16.31. So we're doing far better out of Sam. And the more information we have, the more we can then direct our energies towards the customers and you know, might it be worth giving a discount, for instance, to uh, Gollum if he's prepared to collect his own uh, shoes? But it's just you know, another use of the activity-based costing approach, which um, well, I don't think I need to go on. Helps um, in decisions we might make about our customers. Uh, there's one more exercise on that page, it says customer profitability and customer life cycle. I'll talk much more about life cycles in general in a later chapter, but in terms of customers, as it says, a customer may start off loss making, you know, when we first get a customer and want to make it attractive to them, and they offer them big discounts and things. Uh, but if they turn into long-term customers, maybe later we can start making a profit from them. And an ideal example is exercise five, something that very much happens in uh, real life, in, uh, certainly in the UK. A high street banking business is seeking to attract student customers whom they realise have very little money. And so they're offering these student customers a free rail card a 0% interest overdraft, and a dedicated business advisor. And it says, what is the justification of this? How does it fit into the customer life cycle? Well, in all probability, it's going to cost the banks money. You know, especially if they're not actually charging them anything, it's definitely going to cost them money. They're giving them a free rail card. They're giving them a free overdraft. Um, they're spending money on this dedicated advisor. So they're going to lose money on the student customers. But why are they doing it? What's the justification? Because obviously they're only students for a limited period, whether it's three years, four years, whatever. And um, people tend not to go around changing banks very often. So if they can get them as a regular customer while they're students, then hopefully once they um, stop being students and they get full-time jobs, they'll continue to be customers. Then, of course, they won't get these free benefits. And then, hopefully, they'll become profitable. Um, so that's what I mean. It's part of this life cycle. So they, for a few years, we may, at the back, they may be losing money. But they're prepared to do it if, in the longer term, they start making money, which more than compensates for what they're losing in the short term. Okay, so we'll leave that chapter there. Uh, remember what I said at the beginning of the last, um, uh, the first of the two lectures on this chapter. There um, are practice tests linked from the main SEMA P1 page. So do have a go, just a few questions, but have a go, I'm sure.